Welcome pilots, my name is Hybrid V and today we are going to be talking about CitizenCon Day 1. More specifically, we're going to be talking about the first segment that showed up on Day 1, which is talking about Star Engine, which is what CIG is now calling Star Citizen's engine. Yes, originally it turned from CryEngine to Lumberyard and now they have called it Star Engine. And we got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to be breaking up a lot of day one and day two into multiple parts here, just kind of breaking things down, talking about things in detail, and then, of course, giving you my thoughts and opinions. So let's just jump right into it. First thing we got was, of course, Chris Roberts opening up the entire ceremony, and then they jumped into Star Engine demo reel. I guess you could call it like a sizzle reel of all the features coming into Star Engine and Star Citizen as a whole. And it looked absolutely incredible. I just was absolutely blown away. Also, if you have not seen it yet yourself, I'm not going to put the full thing in here because I don't want to waste your guys' time. I really just want to kind of just jump in and get the meat and potatoes out of all of this. I will have a link down below for you to check it out as CAG has uploaded that full demo reel. So if you want to see that yourself in its entirety without me blathering all over it, that will be down there for you to check out. Now, overall, this demo, like I said, looked incredible. One of the cool things they showed in there was the actual animals and stuff that we had not seen yet. So we saw the space cows, we saw the storm walls. So that was really cool to see. I'd love to see those in game at some point. We've been waiting on those for years, but they hey, they showed it there. It looked awesome. You know what this really was, though? Uh, for those of you watching, did this feel like a slap in the face to Starfield? It really did, because at the beginning they opened it up and said, oh, all this is completely seamless without any loading screens. And I was like thinking the first thing I thought of was Starfield, because that's one of the big criticisms people has had with Starfield is it's very kind of dated approach to its uh, systems and how they use their engine and whatnot. Uh, regardless, it seemed uh, very interesting. But what was also really interesting is it, it was like a it was a demo reel a sizzle reel of all the technology and features that we already know and some new stuff of course that's also gonna be coming in with squadron 42 but it doesn't really look like it was meant to sell the engine to the backers right because why are you selling the engine to the backers we already know a lot of this stuff for the most part this felt like more like a demo reel selling to other developers right and I'm kind of curious, is CIG planning on making Star Engine a licensable engine in the future? Like, a uh, you know, Unreal Engine? Because it seems like that's kind of, it seems like almost like a, com a competition going there. Like, CIG kind of wants to throw their hat in that ring. Now, of course, they didn't actually mention anything about that. But the way they sold it almost kind of seems like they're laying the groundwork for, hey, we kind of eventually want to make this a reality as an engine that you could potentially license. Now, like I said... They didn't explicitly say this anywhere. This is just the feeling I got watching that demo reel because you don't really need a demo reel to show to backers who can already just play the game and already know all this technology. And of course, later on, they talk in more detail about the, this tech. So it's like, why do they need a demo reel for this unless they're trying to sell this to someone, namely other developers or even other potentially publishers? So that's kind of a thing that's been on my mind. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how much that's feasible because, like I said, uh, it originally started as CryEngine. Star Citizen started out as CryEngine. And then they jumped in with Amazon as Amazon had their own forked version of CryEngine, uh, which turned into Lumberyard. They jumped in with Lumberyard and then they've added since then tons of additional improvements and rewrites to the engine to the point where it is now a fork of a fork. And now it's Star Engine. So I'm not sure if they are it, what the legality is of that because, of course, it depends entirely on licensing and who owns what. Uh, if any of you, would, you know, anything know about the the licensing or whatnot for these types of engines, and you know a little bit more about that, please leave me know. Let me know in the comments below. Uh, like, do they have the ability to do this? Like, I'm not certain because uh, if Star Engine is a fork of Lumberyard, which is a fork of CryEngine, uh, I do. I think, if I recall, the the legality is that they technically have their own engine at this point. Like this forked version of this is going to be something that they own proprietarily, like an Unreal Engine type of thing. So it seems like spaghetti mess to me. But again, engines are not really my uh, they're not my wheelhouse. This is not something I'm necessarily that well read into. So if any of you are devs out there and you have a little bit more experience with this type of stuff and you kind of understand that side of things please let me know in the comments below what where that stands actually i'd be very interested to see how that works out but yeah overall this was a really really interesting demonstration of all the technology but again like i said most of the stuff we saw there was stuff we were already used to and then of course some new stuff as well was kind of demonstrated 
After that presentation there, we had Chris come back on stage and he just kind of reiterated a lot of the stuff that was shown in the sizzle reel, really talking about the fidelity and again, the seamless nature, which is constantly being harked on here. Again, in my opinion, it seems like a bit of a, a slap in the face to Starfield. I don't think they're really intentionally going for that. Well, they kind of seem like they are, but at the end of the day, really, that is a thing that they had been going for since day one before Starfield was a thing. It's just that a lot of people really want to compare Starfield to Star Citizen. Even on my channel, when Starfield was first coming out, people were just saying, oh, Starfield is going to be the end of Star Citizen because it's exposing Star Citizen for being the scam that it is. And then Starfield comes out and it turns out that Bethesda just kind of went with the safe, mediocre route. Now, to be clear, this isn't saying that Starfield is bad. I know some of you folks out there probably are actual fans of Starfield. I'm an old Bethesda head. I've been playing since as far back as Morrowind. I love their games. But I played Starfield for about an hour and I immediately got bored of it because it literally felt like once I loaded up and I played it, I was like, I played this game before. This is literally Fallout 4 with jetpacks. I'm sorry. That's really how it felt to me. I had other games I wanted to play, so I went back to playing Baldur's Gate and I went to play Phantom Liberty. I just didn't care. Starfield just did not hold my attention very long compared to their older titles. And I mean, that's just that's how it is. Not It's not always going to work for everyone. So Bethesda tried and unfortunately they have their criticisms. And I think CIG is kind of capitalizing on that. Because people are looking for that. They are looking for a different experience within that genre. But after Chris was finished done with his little monologue there, we had Benoit Beauséjour come in and talk a little bit more. Hopefully I pronounced his name correctly. I do apologize. I'm doing the best I can here, folks. <laughs> he wanted to remind everybody how special the engine is for making Star Citizen what it is and how they want to focus on fidelity, immersion, and seamlessness. Again, seamlessness being kind of almost like a punch in the face to Starfield there. And he also wanted to thank players for helping to bug test and provide feedback in the PU because, of course, we are instrumental for helping them, you know, square all the issues away, including things like PES, which we had snafus with recently. And he wanted to reiterate that CIG and their staff or what they they look for in their staff is individuals who value relentless optimism because it is not exactly something that happens overnight developing this engine. It is a long process. And, of course, Benoit and many others who've worked on like for example server meshing and whatnot like this is a long time coming a decades long process into building out stuff like server meshing and whatnot and even pes and whatnot it was just a long long journey developing the technology behind the engine and to see it finally kind of really reach fruition now uh, you really need really rock solid members of your crew to do that so he kind of wanted to thank everybody for that he wanted to remind everybody that what we are seeing today in these videos uh, is going to be stuff that is going to be in Squadron 42 that was worked on in Squadron 42 and then also is going to be brought into the PU eventually. So everybody was very excited to hear that as well at the time. One thing I noticed is he got very, very emotional in his kind of uh, talk about Star Engine. You can tell he, he's very, very passionate about his work and rightly so. I mean, if you worked on this project for so long and you're kind of it's like watching your child, right? You've developed this child. Or I say developed this child. I say you, you, you've had, you know, you have this child in your family and you're raising them up and now they're becoming kind of an adult. They're kind of going through the teenage and now they're becoming an adult, right? And I think that's kind of like how he looks at it. He, it's his baby, part of, you know, we, we all look at Star Citizen as being like Chris's baby, but in reality, it's everybody's baby. It's your baby. It's my baby. It's Chris's baby. It's Benoit's baby. It's everybody because we are all in it together. We're not creating, or at least us backers here, are not helping Chris Roberts make his dream. We are helping him make everybody's dream. That's what we are doing. At least that's how I look at it. Maybe you have a different opinion about that. You can go ahead and let me know in the comments. But yeah, I do like seeing the developers be very passionate about their work. And of course, the emotions, I think, are more than, I guess you could say, they're more than justified to be emotional about it. Anybody who's worked in this industry or if you've kept up at all with news in the industry knows that the games industry is not exactly always the greatest place to work in. It, many would say it just it, it absolutely blows. And the reason why is if you've seen in the news lately, there's tons of layoffs and whatnot. A lot of uh, big companies are squeezing uh, a lot of their talent out because it's not profitable. At the end of the day, they are beholden to shareholders and they have to constantly do infinite growth. And if they don't make infinite growth, then they start cutting the fat. And then they start over again and again and again and again, constantly trying to 
basically strike gold every single time. And they're constantly chasing trends and whatnot. This is always the thing they're trying to do because profitability is key among everything else. The art is secondary. And I do like that, I mean, although CAG do stumble every now and then in their pursuit of trying to maintain some level of profitability, of course, they do try to put the artistry ahead. And this is this demonstration of Citizen Con was no exception to that, as they put all the actual engineers and artists front and center to talk about their disciplines and what they are actually passionate about, which is something you just don't see in the industry. Any other industry, they don't, they may have like a director of the company or whatever come out and do some stuff. Like, for example, when you think of Bethesda, you just think of Todd Howard, but you don't think about the actual artists and the actual leads and core developers all the way down to the QA members and whatnot. There's no actual, you know, kind of credit given where it's due there, whereas CAG at least will acknowledge that it is a team effort for what they're building here, which is a breath of fresh air compared to how the rest of the industry is. Like I said, they're not perfect, of course, nobody ever is, but it is like it is genuinely like this many years I've been covering this game, or at least I've been playing it, and then I started covering it on the channel back in 2019. You know, it's genuinely been a breath of fresh air seeing how this company operates and compared to other companies. Now, obviously, some people don't like the way they handle their financials. That's well and good. That's a, a definitely a critique we could always talk about. But beyond that, in terms of how they treat their employees, how they treat the projects that they work on, because they are not tied to the hip to, say, a major, major publisher, they're not tied to the hip to shareholders or at least, you know, public trading shareholders, of, of course, do have investors and whatnot. It is really nice to see them focus more on the art and the design and really push that forward rather than trying to push something more like, uh, let's put loot boxes into the game. Let's put gambling mechanics into our game. Let's try to nickel and dime the consumer with these little things here. They're, although they're, they are kind of trying to do that with skins and, and whatnot, I think most people are okay with it because they're very attached to the actual assets of the game. They're attached to the product, so they're willing to part with their money with that. But... You can see a lot of uh, gotcha mechanics in other games, even AAA games. I mean, I just recently, and I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but it, trust me, it all folds back into what I'm talking about here. But I recently just uh, installed Modern Warfare 2 for my father. I know I've talked about him in the past, folks, Like he's kind of getting into gaming now. He really wanted to try it. I put it in for them, and I actually tried it a little bit myself. I've never played Call of Duty since Call of Duty 3, way back in the day. Uh, Modern Warfare 3, way, way back in the day. And, uh... Man, the moment you op open that game, it is just upsell, 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 upsell. It is, oh, it is so frustrating. I don't know how anybody can, I don't know how anybody can play. I mean, the game is good. I actually quite enjoyed it. The multiplayer was actually quite fun. But man, the moment you open it and it's just immediately just upsell, 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 upsell. And like I have to dig through all these menus. I need like a map to find where the campaign is. And then when you click the campaign, it has to open, close the game and open it again. It is just so convoluted. And like this is the the rot that is infecting the AAA industry currently, and I just don't find it sustainable. And like I said, again, it's a breath of fresh air seeing how CAG conduct themselves in comparison to that kind of environment that other developers find themselves in. But yeah, so they were talking about uh, a lot of that stuff, and you can see there was a lot of passion in there. And then once Benoit was done with his opening speech, there they pass it on to Marco Corbetta, who is the VP of Technology at CIG. And he discussed about developing an open universe engine, which is extremely hard, obviously, as we mentioned before. You know, he also reiterated that, you know, the game doesn't have any loading screens. It's pushing procedural generation and streaming to its absolute limits. Again, another jab at, <laughs> at games like Starfield. And uh, also converting this into an online universe makes it even more challenging than single player. Because it's one thing to do for Squadron 42, but to do it in a open universe online is an entirely different challenge and then as one that they've taken a long time trying to get right and uh yeah it's quite interesting so he went into more technical aspects about how like the engine works a lot per frame for its simulations uh he went into a lot of various technical details here and there uh talked about how many things are tracked there's just like tons and tons of entities vehicles objects are all kinds all tracked within the engine at any given moment uh, you know, everything from actors and whatnot, and it's just all seamless, or at least that's how it's intended to be. Of course, we don't always see that because there's always going to be teething issues, but that is, you know, how they are trying to get it down. He then went on to talk about clouds, fog, and weather systems, 
which included things like new features for cloud light shafts with uh, volumetric shadows, new ground fog that follows the terrain up to specific altitudes that can be set by designers. He also then showed a demo reel of the improved atmospheric. So let's go ahead and play that here real quick because I do want to show some of these little demo reels that they have uh, showing off as we go through some of these kind of uh, different technical aspects of the star engine coming up. So let's go ahead and play that real quick. In this video, we're showing all the features combined together. In addition, we made many improvements to cloud shaping to allow for more variation and details. The shape noise blending, a vertical variation has been improved a lot. And as you can hear, the crowd quite enjoyed it because it looks good. It looks incredible. This, this is actually quite nice looking. It is very, very beautiful. Also, we made improvements to short and long distance read and the tiling is less visible. So just to kind of translate what he's saying there, if it's a little uh, hard to hear it, he's basically saying this ground fog helps clear up some of the issues with like texture tiling that you can see from further away. So having these extra fog and this extra atmospherics helps to kind of hide some of that tiling aspects, which also are going to get improved on later, which we'll talk about in a separate video. But that's uh, what he was mentioning there. This improvement to the clouds right here was the biggest by far. Check this out. And, and best of all, best of all, we're going to include all these new features and improvements in the next 3.22 release. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So you can see it looks incredible. It is like insane the amount of detail here. Now, of course, if you, you are a little bit newer to Star Citizen, none of this probably makes any sense to you. But trust us, like uh, for us that play Star Citizen on a day in, day out basis, this is a huge improvement over already what was there. And prior, it already looked good. Now they're just kind of really pushing it from 100% to 110%, 115%, 120%. Some things I really wanted to see, though. CAG, rain! Please give us rain. I want more dynamic clouds, dynamic weathers, not just snow and dust storms. Those are obviously well simple enough to do, but it doesn't make much sense if you're not going to have dynamic weather like rain and whatnot, which they didn't unfortunately showcase here. So it seems like that is still going to be probably way off in the distance because, of course, I don't think that's going to be as necessary for Squadron 42 because if they're going to have dynamic weather like rain or whatever, it's really going to just be static set pieces that are going to have rain. Whereas doing it in a persistent universe where you could be out in the field and it's not even clouds, there's nothing, it's a bright blue sky, and then all of a sudden clouds roll in and then rain, that's a whole other technical aspect to do with volumetric clouds and whatnot. Um, and that is not something that is simple because you have to also make sure that's all synchronized with different clients. So I can understand why this is going to get pushed out to something else later down the line. But anyway, yeah, so that pretty much covers everything regarding the star engine sizzle reel and the opening talking about the technical aspects of star engine as well as the atmospherics clouds and all that so i'm going to go ahead and leave it there for now and i'm going to go ahead and jump in my next video which we're going to be talking about soon which is also talking about things like fire propagation uh, about water simulations and stuff like that so be sure to stay tuned for that video as well all right folks that's it for me today or at least right now talking about the star engine and the actual technical achievements that has uh, CIG has achieved so far. If you did enjoy this video, please leave a like. It really does help out the channel. And of course, if you want to see more videos covering Star Citizen and CitizenCon 2023, subscribe. Until next time, fly safe, and I'll see you all in the black.